Rainbow used to be led by Bob Esport. Bob Esport made John Rainbow so angry that he shot him and killed him. Why did John Rainbow kill Bob Esport? Is Tom Clancy still rolling in his grave? Find out next time on... Rainbow Six Siege, the game, is its own unique little story of developer decisions that people find unpopular or not so great. But in the span of Rainbow Six The License, Rainbow Six Siege actually did something that was much more controversial than nerfing your favorite operator. Rainbow Six Siege made an attempt to bridge the gap narratively with the fact that it was a multiplayer only experience with a slant towards competitive esports by introducing the character of Harry, a director for Rainbow that wanted to do a global tournament of champions, a global spectator sport where people could go to an arena in Greece and basically treat it like tactical Olympics. That was the idea, at least in concept. While there were several authenticity and realism aspects about this that I thought were a little bit strange for a Tom Clancy license, I ultimately didn't really care because the game's focus was multiplayer. And when a game's focus is multiplayer, I don't really treat the writing and the story as integral to the game's success. That's not the main selling point of why people are playing the game. If we look at the gaming landscape nowadays, it seems that games that should really be trying to focus on creating an enticing multiplayer experience lend a lot of marketing money an effort to the what feels like AI generated backstory and characters. Now, Overwatch, some people really, really like Overwatch's story, for example, and all of their cutscenes that they've done for them, the big cinematics that they do for promotional periods where they have a character's backstory kind of explored in this little cinematic sequence, those do very well. So I'm not saying that it's a one size fits all approach and different companies have different reasons to lean into their creative side more than others. In the case of Rainbow though, Harry's decision to create the Tournament of Champions was an extremely controversial decision. Something that a lot of people cite to this day as an example of where Ubisoft ruined or even killed the Rainbow franchise. Harry's background and contributions to Team Rainbow were implied to be something of a sort of Renaissance academic. He seemed to be the kind of guy who knew a number of different foreign languages fluently. He was principally a psychologist and he seemed to approach Rainbow's recruitment from an analytical point of view. I'm assuming in that sense, Harry probably used his knowledge of politics, history, world religions, philosophy, culture, and many other things that had to do with people to make compelling cases to people across the world to join Rainbow. And as a result of Harry's introduction to the narrative, we started to see people added to Rainbow, I guess you could say the organization, not necessarily in a tactical, kicking down doors, shooting bad guys kind of way. He would also recruit the background, the logistics of the operation. Yana, for instance, was a very controversial addition to the game because she was not a tactical operator. It was not implied that she was going into buildings door to door doing Jocko Willink shit. Rainbow the game, as it existed previously, focused on the operators though. It focused on the team play dynamic of you basically conducting an involved police raid from the outside in to bad guys inside of a building. So when the game, you know, lore-wise depicted it as a training exercise, but you still had the Metal Gear Solid uh, technology demonstrator going in and doing the same thing that Blackbeard was doing, that caused a disconnect for a lot of people and it motivated people to have pretty negative opinions about where Ubisoft was going with the game thematically, artistically, in terms of the overall project focus of Ubisoft. And for many, many years, a lot of people were calling for Ubisoft to just stop making these cutscenes, to stop doing the cinematics and the anime stuff where we had this tactical Olympics going on. There were complaints about the seriousness of the writing and the dialogue. There was a whole plot that was essentially a Captain America Civil War many years too late sort of thing where you had Ash, the cook by the book, follow the military protocol, step-by-step -step process sort of thing. You had people in her camp and then Callie, who was a PMC, and she didn't give a crap, right? She just, whatever, finish the mission, doesn't matter, fuck the rules kind of thing. And that plot could have worked in an environment where I think Harry would be the main character of, say, a dedicated single-player experience where he's assigning operators to different tasks on a global map. Maybe Callie could have, you know, 
gone off the handle where she was assigned to a mission, she didn't follow orders, and then Ash gets pissed about that, and then there's conflict. That could have made that sort of angle work, because Ash, in a cutscene that they did when they were releasing Nighthaven, was very critical of the fact that Harry was working with a private military corporation. This concept, to me, was so much more interesting than what we got with the tournament arc, that I actually made a poll for my community here for today's Yap Sesh. And it seemed that a lot of people wouldn't have hated the tournament stuff if Harry had just been used in a different kind of way. If Harry's focus in Rainbow wasn't just this example of trying to get the esports stuff to be a little bit more palatable for Siege's mainstream audience, then people probably would have been able to swallow it better. A plurality of my audience actually didn't mind the esports angle, as you can see. But it does appear that there was a demand for something that was different than what we got. The top of the distribution actually comes in second place. If you were to take the two results here, I would have disliked the esports angle strongly, or I wouldn't have been happy about it, but it's fine. Make up 41% of my audience underneath 46%. This was fascinating to me because it tells me, one, my audience didn't really care about the fact that they were doing the esports thing, but it also tells me that even for people who still weren't happy about it, they would have been okay with it if there was other fare to enjoy that wasn't just that. Something that I go back to frequently whenever I talk about the overarching development history of the game is that it's clear that the creative team has bones for something a little bit more traditional in terms of a $60 single player release. And that is shown in the concept art where Harry is this globetrotting academic figure, like I mentioned earlier. The reason that he knows Warden on a first name basis is because he met him while he was doing something, I guess, that attracted the attention of the US president at the time. That's Obama. It's, it's Obama, man. Like, c c give me a break. Whoever was, whoever drew this, was not trying to hide that, okay? They're not beating the allegations. I'm sorry. It's cool. I, I think it's really cool. But you're not beating the allegations, man. I know what you were doing. Harry is implied to have found out and discovered Nuck's royal bloodline, even while she's incognito and anonymous in this crowd. I love this shot, too. This is so cool. I love these shots. These shots are classic Tom Clancy to me. These are shots that are representative of something that you could do with an animated series or a TV show. Or, you know, a video game. That would have been interesting. But that's not what we got. People are talented artists. They can whip something together like this relatively quickly and then move on from it. And I understand that, even if it doesn't necessarily get extrapolated into the product that we might think of. The point is, I didn't hate Harry as a character. I understood what they were trying to go for, but in execution, clearly with your target audience, that was something that did not land well. Rainbow Six Siege is a live service multiplayer experience. When you take a license that previously existed that was, you know, primarily popular for its single player, more curated, you know, kind of experiences, and you try to make it more abstract and try to make the writing of the reason that we're doing the training exercise work, then things start to get a little bit convoluted. You start to avoid pinpointing, you know, actual specific kinds of plot lines, very three act structured sort of stories. A lot of what is conveyed in the concept art for a lot of these characters, for pretty much every freaking character in the game um, ends up getting lost in the noise of selling a product, selling Siege as a service, as a sporting experience, not a curated narrative experience. Just about every live service game suffers from this problem. I remember when Valorant first arrived on the scene and there were some pretty interesting pieces there that I actually thought were really cool. I thought it was really cool how KO was basically just robot future trunks. Like, Brimstone dies in his original timeline because Reyna and the besties just form, like, the League of Evil Bitches? She starts a global civil war and K.O. is a machine that's designed to kill Radianites, people like Reyna that can use these, you know, magic powers or whatever. Like, Reyna is a villain! <laughs> she- she's bad! Okay, she's bad, but, like, she's bad! So K.O. kills Reyna. You know, because women can't have hobbies anymore. Um, and then he comes back to, I guess, you know, canonically our timeline, which is you playing Valorant. Like, there's some components there where I'm like, hey, wait a minute, that's kind of, that's kind of a cool idea. That's a really, really cool idea. I'm totally down with that. And then I never get that because it's a competitive shooter. And that's the product, right? The product is 
playing the competitive shooter. It's it's none of the creative stuff, which I think is kind of lame. I, I do miss that. I do miss that about gaming. And I understand why people, you know, have a sometimes kind of nasty uh, response to it. Now, it doesn't justify, you know, some of the more weird responses but i don't think there's a bad reason to look at the you know the live surface landscape and go man like all the all the creativity seems to be just kind of gone now but rainbow six siege did something that no other live service multiplayer game in the market has currently done and that is acknowledge that they screwed up that part that they screwed up the storytelling and that was really interesting to me i i thought that introducing deimos and having deimos shoot harry in the chest and he's just done like that entire arc, all the stuff that we did, tournament stuff, esports, whatever, the weird kind of, you know, marvely plot that's too many years out of date, that's over, all right? Next chapter. Ubisoft was under no obligation, zero obligation to do that. They could have completely ignored all of the world building and the lore and the vibe and all of this stuff because it is a multiplayer. That's what Valorant did and they're making a shit zillion dollars every day. Valorant, when has Valorant even tried to connect some of the threads that it was making, you know, at least around uh, its first year of release. I thought they were going to go somewhere with that. They had all these really cool cutscenes that they did um, with the different characters and like animated kinds of shots and stuff. And then it just completely, totally, totally, all of that is gone. It's all about the esports. It's about you. It's about people playing an esports game, which was really strange coming from Riot because we just had Arcane and Arcane even took creative liberties with the previously established stuff that League of Legends did. It, it, it retconned elements of previously existing, you know, I guess you could call it League of Legends lore, right? But even League of Legends, a multiplayer game, leans into character interactions. There's unique dialogue lines between different characters stuff like that. They really do try to lean into it, even though it's a multiplayer game. So who's to say Siege can't do it? Well, I think Ubisoft feels like they can do something else here. So when Deimos killed Harry, that was an indication that we are undergoing a significant paradigm shift in how we approach the design, the artistic design of the game. And that's also going to lean into it mechanically as well. One of the first things that Rainbow Six Siege did balance-wise after we started this new journey uh, in year eight was the one in the chamber mechanic. If you reload, you can't reload cancel. You have to commit to the animation. You still have one bullet left in the chamber. That's a realism mechanic. Now, a lot of people who, you know, aren't directly familiar with how firearms work will obviously note that, you know, all your ammunition doesn't just like magically meld into this, you know, giant pool of ammunition that you can pull out of your ass who have individual magazines, but it did feel just a tiny bit more authentic. Just a, just a little bit. They slowed down the ADS time again and again and again. A lot of people, you know, one argument that I've heard about the ADS time and the sprinting and the mobility and all this is that, well, these guys are super well-trained operators. They should be able to fucking bolo pee. Um, those guys are self-reporting that they've never shot a firearm in their fucking life. <laughs> Those guys don't know what they're talking about. Shooting a firearm from sprint to standing accurately at a distance with the full spray is not something everybody can do. It's something that requires a significant amount of practice, just like anything else. And I remember the community reaction after Deimos killed Harry. A lot of people were saying, well, this guy's, you know, he's here to take out the trash. Yeah. Yeah, I like him. <laughs> Which um, some of those guys were a little bit too excited about it. Just a little bit. Just a little, you know, trying to say something else, man. Eh. It advanced the story with new dynamics. It created a powerful, memorable moment. The reactions, as far as I could tell, were overwhelmingly positive. Not necessarily because, you know, they wanted Harry dead, although some people certainly did, but Harry had to be the fall guy for Siege's rebirth. Harry was a real one, okay? Like, R.I.P. my boy. One of the most common arguments about Siege's art style is how different the operators look now versus how they did then. And then it just gets conveniently ignored that the game had a deliberate, very, very obvious effort to make tactical operator designs with a little bit of Tom Clancy sauce, right? We had Brava, we had Grimm, we had Solus. Some people were complaining about the Solus, like bunny ears. Some people were complaining about that in good faith. They were like, I, you know, a little too much. All right, fine, whatever. I would argue that it's in line with Tom Clancy, you know, especially if you played stuff like Ghost Recon Future Soldier, but fine. But some people um, were just angry about every single thing that got added to Rainbow Six because it's not Rainbow Six as it was conceived in the 90s. And that's silly. The world is not the same as it was back in the 90s. And I'm not even saying that. I know that people are gonna, you know, take that and imply, oh yeah, before you added woke, 
that's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the way that people approach security policy, geopolitical relationships are not the fucking same as they were during the Clinton administration. Neither are art styles. Neither are what kind of content, what kind of media do people consume. Stuff changes. The Mandalorian season one was evocative of a lot of the same kinds of energy, the same kind of seriousness, the same kind of vibe that was captured in the original Star Wars trilogy and a lot of the expanded sort of, you know, video game stuff that happened during that big LucasArts run in the mid 2000s. I hope people are understanding what I'm saying, right? Like art, what it does is it's responsible for creating emotions that we can't necessarily articulate. We try our best to, but a lot of the same emotions that I got out of watching Star Wars as a kid when they were VHS tapes was what I got out of watching Mandalorian season one. It's not directed the same way. It's not even written the same way, but it makes me feel like it's Star Wars. Same thing with Rogue One, same thing with Andor. Rainbow Six Siege, year eight through whatever, right? Ever since Deimos shot Harry, ever since Gerald Morris shot Harry, this can be an extension of the original Clancy writing. This can be an extension of the original games as they existed a long time ago. And it can still be its own unique creative endeavor that exists unto itself while taking cues from something else that existed previously. This is very common in comic books, for example. Again, a lot of people are gonna take the most uncharitable position there and say, yeah, well, comic books suck now. Fine, sure, okay. Y yeah, everything sucks. <laughs> all art sucks. It's all woke or something. And I'm not saying that everybody had an issue with previously existing Clancy stuff because it was woke. I thought they were gonna go into a much more identity politics kind of lean with Deimos. I was pleasantly surprised to find out that, oh yeah, this guy has purely personal motivations that have to do with a sort of warrior ethos of his own. And that was a million times more compelling than anything I thought that they were gonna do. I looked at the initial cutscene in year eight and thought, okay, I'm sort of, you know, I'm looking at this from the cookie cutter sort of thing that I would expect from most mainstream media productions. And what I got was something that was much more provocative, much more enticing, much more representative of the mix of political intrigue and espionage, the James Bond stuff, the Jack Bryan stuff that I grew up with. And I'm really glad that they did that. I'm really glad that even though Rainbow Six Siege is a multiplayer only game, that they still decided to try. I don't know what it's gonna look like. I don't even know if they're gonna stick the landing, but I'm happy that they're making an attempt. And I think that was Ubisoft reading the room and understanding, okay, you know, we need to kind of, we need to reassess how we're approaching this based off of the feedback that they got, which was pretty negative about the esports tournament arc stuff. So at the end of the day, if Ubisoft isn't allowed to move on from the past, then yeah, I guess gaming will just never heal. I guess the only kinds of gaming content that we're ever going to be able to upload on YouTube are videos, you know, two hour long video essays talking about how the esports industry, you know, ruined it with woke slop or something. I'm tired of the algorithmic opinion centering. I'm tired of the algorithmic populism, basically, that's happening in the gaming industry that's been happening for the past, you know, better part of four years. If the game stinks, say that it stinks. If it's good, just say that it's good. Or maybe it's okay. Don't judge something until it comes out. You don't win a prize. You don't get brownie points if a game looks like it could be okay, and then you say, yeah, well, you know, this is, this is gonna suck. And then you get proven right. And then it's like, yeah, see, see, I called that. Like there's a difference between being disappointed that a game sucks and being happy that a game sucks because it means you got proven right on the internet. Like, bro, I have no clue what Rainbow Six Siege is gonna become, but you know what? If they're at least willing to try, I don't necessarily mind if they, you know, have an anime cutscene here or there or make a freaking comic book. Who cares? As long as it's not taking away from the asset production on the ground of content that people want to enjoy, who cares? Let the artists have a little bit of fun with it. What is the what is the comic book guy gonna do? Is the comic book guy gonna nerf the R4C? N no. Why do gamers act like they can see what's happening inside the building? Racing games suck nowadays. That doesn't mean that the guy who plays racing games for an esports living needs to be arguing with an F1 driver about how his car handles in real life. That that has happened. I'm not making that up. I think people just just need to give Ubisoft a fucking break. Just like, let them have a little bit of fun with it. If they don't necessarily, you know, go in the direction that you would like, then 
It's a multiplayer game, so I'm not really sure what you're expecting 10 years later. Like, look at this cutscene they did for Deimos. They didn't have to do this. This is sick. This is fucking sick. Try not to disappoint me, soldier. The guy who does the voice is a good actor. Like, the music's good. It's well directed. Why are we still mad? Why are we still mad that the tournament shit happened? Oh yeah, you think Rainbow Six is an anime? Yeah, well you're judging the anime by the filler arc, man. <laughs> Why? Long story short, Harry had to go, not because I didn't like the guy, but because Ubisoft needed to let Rainbow Six Siege sprout its wings. And I'm glad that we're in a different direction because some of what we've been offered now is pretty fun. It's pretty badass. And I'd like to see them explore it more. Let me know what you think about this whole approach that we've had since year eight in the comments down below. I'll be around for tomorrow's Yap Sesh with a special guest. Ooh, thanks so much for watching. Deuces.